Making progress on the. What do you got there? Over. Oh, sure. Make any progress on the tiring? No. No, we only have six applications. So you're going back out? Well, that's after going back out. And so we're going to start that new process next week. Six oh, with the six? Six. Yeah, it only takes one. You need two, you right? Need two. Yeah. Like I said, you can do background. Are these a lot of guys? Yes. Yeah. So they should, in theory, have a lot of background issues. But, uh, <laughs> you never know, right? You could have had that. Give it a souvenir for you. Uh, good evening. I want to uh, start. I hint. I think I, everybody has a copy of this. Pretty routine month. I want to start by saying uh, I really uh, uh, thank the uh, council and for the support on, around our levy that uh, was recently passed. Just short of seventy five percent, seventy four point seven percent of the affirmative votes on that, which is pretty impressive. That three quarters of the people vote for anything, let alone a, a tax, right? Uh, so. Uh, we appreciate that. I appreciate the council letting me pitch that here and, you know, uh, and your support. And, and a number of you had to sit through the presentation multiple times at various community groups, as I did on my own mic, Ed, and others. Uh, so I thank you for uh, tolerating that. Uh, we'll, we'll be set to continue to move forward, you know, for the next four years. Uh, actually, almost five, because it doesn't expire until the end of this year. Uh, so in the report... Um, Pretty routine month, uh, 103 or 4 calls it looks like in the Liberty Lake area. As you can imagine, the kind of month we had, weather-related uh, calls were a big deal, both uh, traffic accidents, which Brian probably had so many that they're still writing reports in March. Uh, but we, we, I looked through this as an abnormal amount, 20 accidents in Liberty Lake for us in a month is a lot of auto accidents. Uh, that, that, those are the ones that we responded to, not police department. So a number of those were severe accidents. So it looks like uh, more than a handful of those uh, ended up, maybe half of, half of them or more, uh, getting transported to the hospital. So some pretty serious injuries related to that, obviously with the snow and the kind of roads we had that's kind of comes with it, I guess. Uh, also, uh, you know, and the, the majority of the other calls medical related. Um, these types of uh, cold weather events like this that are extended, as long as we've been in this cold weather, are difficult on the frail population. So folks with pre-existing conditions, the young and the old, even if they're not out in it very much, struggle uh, during these these uh, either hot spells or really cold spells like this. So we see, we saw across the department, department-wide, 
uh, several hundred more calls for service, mostly medical related, not auto accident related, uh, for the month of February. So Liberty Lake just trends like the rest of it uh, did. So uh, with that, there's a few a few noted there uh, for your uh, review, and then on the back page, just a plot map of the uh, of the locations. So that's all I had. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have regarding anything. Uh, well, just uh, talking to Pat, who was here last time at our council meeting, in regards to uh, CPR. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things we talked to Pat about was the opportunity to maybe do CPR at the farmer's market to yeah. get people involved and bring your mannequin yeah. to the <laughs> right. Fellow, your mannequin. Right. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so was, I thought it was a great idea. We talked about that at our staff meeting last week, I think, Steve. And we're going to do that. Mike Charter, the MS chief, will be in contact with you to kind of coordinate that, and we'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll cover CPR, AD, and uh, Pulse Point app all, all together in one bundle, and have it here, and you can store the equipment or whatever we need to do. Katie, do we have the Notify me. Can we kind of tie in something like false point? Yeah. So there's kind of the notify me and then notify us. So notify me means we send people an email. Notify us. People send us an email. But I can look and see. Um, Greg Rogers is a real. You know, he's here a lot and he interacts with us a lot. I know there was a effort to go out and change um, batteries and and smoke smoke detectors over in the Riverwalk area. But anyway, what I was going to say, Mayor, is he has some literature that he uses for um, public engagement, and I can we can take that and put it on our website I'm just saying and just send it. Put it, push it out so right. that you know it kind of ties those things together. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, we made you know pretty good progress. We continue to make decent progress around CPR, especially with Washington State adopting the fact, uh, adopting the the regular the law uh, that high school uh, students have to have it before they graduate now across the state. So mandatory for Washington high schooler to come out of a public high school with CPR training, which is great. Um, now we just need we need to we really need to get AEDs. Uh, we need to see progress there. We've, we've done a pretty good job getting people to put them in buildings, gyms, facilities, public places, airports. There are a lot of them around, but they're only used about 3% of the time. And I think people are intimidated um, by them. Uh, not so much the younger generation. They've kind of grown up not being afraid of that kind of stuff, but more probably our, our my generation. <laughs> I am Brian. Careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I was actually on the phone with Pulse Point uh, today about uh, some, some public outreach stuff that we're going to be uh, working together on to see if we can get that, uh, get that number up, get that use up, and get people, uh, I think it's a couple of things. One is they're somewhat afraid of, intimidated by it. Secondly, in an emergency situation, I think they forget to look for it. You know, think about it. You know, when an emergency happens right in front of you, you're kind of consumed by that unless you're thinking outside that. So it's kind of like muscle memory. You know, I mean, you have to do it, try it a couple of times. And then, yeah. You know, then you feel more comfortable with it. Yeah. And these AEDs are now fully automatic. So really, other than peeling the pads and sticking them on the body, they do everything else for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's really pretty simple. Maybe push a button when it says push the button, but. Yeah. I think when <clears throat> when you first started the Pulse Point app, it sounds like there was a lot of quick participation with regards to registering AEDs and stuff. Yeah. Um, I noticed we happened to be over at Tritina this weekend, and like I know I noticed they have one, but I when I looked last time, they didn't have it. I haven't looked since Saturday, but when I looked before uh, this summer when I was over there, they didn't have it registered. Is there some 
way to get the word out to businesses and things like that to remind them to get yeah. them on the app? Yeah. So there's a couple things we could do there. Um, so we inspect those businesses every year. So our fire inspector should be getting that message across when they do their annual inspection. The other things we've been doing is a new program that we're doing around risk reduction is uh, we have an apartment program where we bring in these um, building and apartment managers uh, into our facility for a one or two day work session on safety in apartment buildings. And we cover pulse point, we cover smoke detectors, we cover exiting, we cover a lot of different things in hopes that we can train them to train their residents. Um, and so that's a new program. We've had really good uh, early success with that, but but it hasn't. Obviously, it's a big valley with a lot of apartments. We have a lot of uh, a lot of education to do around that. But but I look at the inspection program as guaranteed. We're in those every year. We should be checking um, checking the batteries while we're there, uh, and leaving information. Yeah, yeah. You know, or even you know I can see you know inspector going in kind of educating the management or whoever, you know, like it's routine about it, but are they going to take that next step to register it? So, you know, even if the extra step could be taken from your side, hey, let me help you get it on here while I'm here. Yeah. If that's something that can help, I think that would be more of a guarantee. Yeah, I should, sh I could probably teach our inspectors to use, uh, so we developed a second app with PulsePoint a little bit later after we originally developed the first app, and the second app actually, all you got to do is uh, point, you know, take a picture of the AED, and it actually registers it in the system. It lat longs it, GPSs it, and then it it ties it into PulsePoint so that if it's activated, PulsePoint app knows where that AED yeah, is and cool. it can map you to it. Uh, I don't know that I've ever shared that with our inspectors, like how to get that in the system. So simple, you just everybody has a phone. You just take a picture of it, and then it basically does everything else. That'd be that'd be another thing they could do to get it in the yeah. system. So any anybody has like we have the pulse point on our phone. So yeah. if we take a picture of the AED. It's a separate app. It's so you have the pulse point responder app. There's a pulse point AED app. Okay. So it's what it's called. It's got a yellow icon instead of the red one. Uh, but it, but if you look that up, you see it. Um, and then anywhere you're at, like if I'm in an airport, I just take a picture. If it's already in the database, it won't do anything. It'll say, yeah. you know, it's not going to put it in there ten times. But uh, as I walk around and I see them, I just shoot photos and uh, enter them into the system. To expand upon that education piece, for not only CPR but AEDs, I'm wondering if it would be possible, and, you know, you can obviously know better than I would, um, to have a booth at Liberty Lake Days when we have it in the summer, yeah, and have, you know, CPR training every couple hours for anyone yeah. interested in doing it. We can have the AED there to take that fear away of what... Right, just represents. play with them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, we yeah. can teach some people CPR during that. Yeah. We have a lot of great booths that this program has to do with, you know. Right. You can get to have that there as well. Yep. You can certainly do that. Good idea. Next chief. Next chief. Next chief. Chief number two. The older, the older chief. Chief, chief. The younger, the younger chief. I don't think so. I don't think so. He's taller. I just look older. Oh, taller. I've had a tough go. The taller. The taller. I'm the taller chief. Well, good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Um, so I have a report. It's up on the screen for you to, to review. Just a couple of highlights I want to hit. One is our number of calls for service for the month of February is 453, which is really about our average, actually a little less than uh, we have been running for the last several months. Uh, so that is actually uh, good news uh, for us. Um, and then the Chief Collins point talked about that number of accidents. So we responded to seven accidents within the city limits itself, which I think um, when you look at how many in the, in the Liberty Lake region that uh, Spokane Valley Fire responded to, it uh, says really a lot for uh, how well we do with our, our roads. Um, so uh, keep that in mind for maybe a later later discussion. But uh, only seven for the entire month, considering all the snow that we've had, um, is, uh, is good. good for us. And then I'm happy to report a, a zero, actually, on this column for number of malicious mischiefs. And I think that might have something to do with our temperatures being 20 <laughs> degrees low as normal for the month of February. It keeps uh, people Too inside. Too cold Yeah. So. Um, and then uh, also there's some of the highlights on there um, 
obviously there's some vehicle collisions. Um, we did have, uh, talking about the AEDs, there, there was a, a, a Liberty Lake resident that was helping other people in neighborhoods shoveling their walkways and stuff, um, uh, had a heart attack. Uh, there was an uh, off-duty firefighter that was on scene right away that had an AED and uh, good medical response, quick medical response, officers responded. Uh, CPR was uh, conducted along with the AED for uh, a long time, but um, was not successful. Uh, so uh, sad, a sad day, but uh, I mean, how fortunate it was that we have first responders that were there <coughs> with an AED uh, in that, that situation. So, in relation to the AEDs, can can just anybody purchase them? You can. You you can buy them via uh, through Costco.com, Costco. you know, and other places. Um, our responders carry them off duty, so yeah. we're we're a part of a pilot that Pulse Points doing with four four places around the country where our uh, it's called verified responders. We actually will respond to private residences uh, off duty, our firefighters, and we've done that seven times now, just since we became part of the pilot. So are they temperature uh, sensitive at all? The AEDs. Yeah. Uh, I. Not that I'm aware of, other than the battery is probably not good for the battery to be out there for long periods in your car, you know. Um, but the, normally, you know, the way Pulse Point works, sources public areas. So uh, we originally designed that to be activated in a public area, not private spaces for obvious personal, re you know, reasons. You don't want strangers showing up at your house necessarily. Right. But we've expanded that group piloting, like I said, this new program where these these verified responders, which are our employees, I think we have about 70 of them that are, that go home, including me, uh, with the, with the firefighter. And then the, if your neighbor or somebody in a private residence that's within a half mile of you has it, you can get activated from home and and maybe beat the fire department or police department over there. Yeah, I'm just asking because I, I have a lot of people retired in my neighborhood, and I typically try to do their driveways and their forum. But yeah. I don't to get to my, I'm always concerned about that if, you know, Something happens like that. Right. Um, in other news, um, Austin Brandingham, who's been an officer with us for, for a period of time, he started with us as a uh, intern when he was at Eastern Washington University, finishing up his uh, uh, degree in criminal justice. Uh, then we brought him on as a reserve officer, and we hired him as an entry-level officer. Uh, so he's accepted the, a position I told you about last time with Cheney. Uh, his last uh, official day will be Friday. Uh, so I think tonight's his last <coughs> night working. Uh, so I'll be meeting with him this evening after the council meeting. So I wish him uh, well, um, and uh, we'll, he'll be missed and sad to see him go. Uh, but with that, we are interviewing uh, potential new candidates next week. Uh, we have six that we will be um, talking to on our oral boards, and then uh, hopefully out of that get a few people that can get to a final interview with, with the mayor um, and hopefully make a couple selections from that pool. So heard great things about the two new hires. They're doing so great. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. So our new uh, new folks are doing really good. They're about halfway through their field training program right now. Uh, so by first week of April or so, they'll, they should be out on their own. Doing very well. Yeah. Doing yeah, good Stephanie is what she's Stephanie. Her mom works at Field House. Yeah. And oh, okay. That, yeah, she, I saw her the day after we swore, and she's like, oh. aren't you a counselor? <laughs> you look familiar, too. So, yeah, she's yeah, excited so they, yeah. to have her back. Yeah. So, yeah, great, great hires. So they're doing well. Um, also, in this, you can look at the crime map, which is you know, a bunch of dots that outline this 453 calls for service that uh, we had in the city. And <clears throat> last thing I want to uh, report on is that we had a successful polar plunge event. It's very, very cold. Um, instead of me talking about it, I'm going to hopefully we can get it to work, show you this clip from K or CREM2. Um, <laughs>
Oh, it's a little chilly. So it's pretty cold out there. So why don't you tell us again, why are you guys out here doing that? So we are out here to raise funds and awareness for Special Olympics Washington. Uh, right here in our region, we have about 1,500 uh, Special Olympic athletes. <coughs> and all the money raised today during our Super Punch event, and tomorrow during our Team Punch event, uh, stays here locally to help support our athletes. So what would you say to get people to come out tomorrow and do that? Well, you can tell it looks like a lot of fun. Um, so tomorrow, uh, we're going to have our big pink plunge. So we'll have some activities here. We'll have some live music. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks. And we have warming tents that keep people comfortable. Uh, so come out and join us and support a great cause. All right, on-site registration at 9. You can go ahead and run back to the tent. I know you're waiting to do that again. <laughs> on-site registration at 9. And then the plunge tomorrow is at 12. I'll send it back to you in the studio. I'm impressed you're so chattering. Uh, I know. Yeah, Interviewing me after, after jumping in was, uh, was interesting. I'm not uh, but, <laughs> so thanks to all of you that, that donated. It was a successful event. Um, that as of the day of, we had about $25,000 raised. Um, as of today, because donations continue to come in, we're just over $30,000. All that stays local with our, for our special mix. Wow. So, so thanks, thanks to the city for allowing me to do such uh, crazy things and spending mm -hmm. time. Uh, working on on this, uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, the fire department should really get jumped into that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've tried for years. So, yeah, I, forgot about it. I even have a good name. It's Fire Nice. Fire your team fire name. It's a good name. I know. I can probably find somebody, <laughs> but it wouldn't be me. Miss <laughs> Mary, that's all I have. Unless you have any questions. I can't stay warm in my house. <laughs> I'd like to. Give a compliment to the fire department. So one day last week, we were, <coughs> Betty and I were driving home in our where we live, and there was a, a fire truck, not a fire truck, but a truck was there, and a fireman was shoveling out this lady's driveway, which I thought was a great program that you had. And I wanted to ask Jen, who got the uh, snow angels and stuff, and we, we've, I'm sure we've had some good success with that. Yeah, I think that's a great program. Well, Betty and I were so motivated that. <laughs> When we saw him doing that, we thought, gee, that's a good idea. So I think it was Thursday or Friday, we took the snowblower and went to the neighborhood and thought, well, let's blow out a couple of these just to be nice. nice. Now picture this. We're all bundled up, and we do this one house, and this lady walks out, and she says, I'm so thankful that you're doing that. And it was so great to see you young kids. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know how old she is, but I'll take any compliment I can get. <laughs> Uh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I told her no checks. <laughs> but it's a great, I, I think it was outstanding. Yeah. It was great to I, see that. Yeah. And Jen, I think it's a great, you know, that's working out well. Thank you. Justin? All right. Mayor, Council, I have a few things to talk about tonight. Um, so February was a bit of a slower month. Snow probably had a big impact in that. Um, but we still managed to check out 7,500 books and had for a lot of people come to our program, still over 400 people coming to story times. So those story time parents, they come for just about anything um, that you do. And then one of the things that we did was um, we had a group of um, older elementary, young middle school kids came and they made a zine at the library, so it's like a magazine, basically. But I thought I'd hand this around because they spent a few hours with an instructor putting this together, and I just thought that was a really nice example of some of the things that we can do over there. The age group for that, Jocelyn? That was mostly upper elementary with a few going into the sixth grade-ish area. You're probably more artistic than I am. <laughs> Definitely more than me, so. <laughs> um, and then um, in your next city council packet, I'll have the um, library annual report. So I just wanted to show you a few highlights. Um, total circulation for the year was about 150,000, uh, with about 15,000 of that being digital media. Um, we have about 28,000 materials in our building, and then we have about 63,000 digital materials that people can check out. So about 69% of our collection is digital now. Um, we added about 2,500 
items and deleted about 2300 so kept that about even over the year um, and when we delete things most of the time it's based on conditions sometimes it's because of currency or things like that you know we noticed that it's a book from 1998 and there's been a few wars since then so maybe it's time for us to update that one um, we had about 423 programs and over 14,000 people attend those so I figure that's pretty good for our community um, and we've got about 7,000 library cards, 64% of those are resident, and 36% are non-resident. And then, um, you guys all see the budget, but here's just a smaller breakdown of that. Salaries and benefits counts for about 80%, which is about average, I think, for a public service agency like ourselves. 7% um, of that went to collection. And then the rest of that um, office and operating, those are, you know, the supplies we need for various operations. Um, utilities and phone. <clears throat> Programming was 1.5%. And then software and databases, 1.2%. And then donations, we are lucky to have some community groups and individuals who like to support the library. And that totaled um, almost $7,000 last year. Uh, so things we're working on, library board, um, we're working on some policy review. The next board meeting we'll be talking about our patron conduct policy and some of our circulation policies. And then after that we've got duties and responsibilities of patrons and exhibits and displays. And then one of the things that my staff is working really hard on right now is developing or updating all of our procedures manuals. Uh, we haven't had written circulation manuals. It's sort of been, oh, this is how we do it. And then people may or may not have the correct idea of which way it goes, or oh, that was before this update. Or, so we're trying to all get on the same page by having these written backups for ourselves. Um, and then the community needs assessment that has been posted, and um, the deadline for questions came last Friday. So. Um, the deadline for people to submit proposals on March 15th. I've had about 12 different people contact me with questions or to let me know that they were interested. So that's pretty good. And then um, even with the snow, we've had some facility stuff done. Um, our parking lot lights, half of the parking lot has been switched over to LED and our entry canopy lights got replaced and it is much brighter out there. So that's really wonderful. And then I wanted to let everybody know, um, I'm really excited because we subscribed to another database this month. Um, I'll be highlighting it probably by the end of this week or next week on our website. It's called Gale Legal Forms. And this is one where if you want to look for information, you know, maybe a landlord-tenant thing, or maybe you're looking for a power of attorney, these are Washington State-specific forms that you can download and, and use. Um, so as long as you access this from our website using your library card. We've got a number of different things that can be used. There's, yeah, I, I really like it. I have used it before myself, so. I get a lot of people that ask me about, you know, um, oils and stuff like that. So I have to move to sit down. That's yeah. That's the direction we're moving to people. Very cool. And let's see some programs coming up, just so you have an idea. We're going to be doing a computer teardown where our um, technical specialist is going to be bringing in some of his own old computers um, and then people can come in and sort of take them apart and see what the innards look like and if there is time try and put it back together and see if it will work again. Um, we're doing a second series of the Block Souls, which is an app that kids can use to learn programming um, for video games and other things. And then we're doing some um, sort of mental health and overall health classes. So we've got mindfulness and meditation this month, as well as essential oil jewelry. And of course, we've got book clubs and our Nerf War, Star Wars Nerf War, later this month for the 11 to 17 year old crowd. So that is what is going on at the library. Mayor. Uh, programs to Spokane Valley Library. I mean, I mean the number and you know, um, participation. You know, I don't know their participation numbers. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm sure that will come out in an annual report, but it won't be by that particular branch. Right. 
Um, what I do know is, um, what some staff have told me, is that sometimes our programs will draw people from other libraries because it, it sounds like a better idea or it's something they're not doing. Um, and I, I know just general anecdotal feedback that we get from a number of the people who come is that they enjoy our smaller library atmosphere where they don't fear to go in. Um, and that just the staff that are there are, are nice and they enjoy interfacing with us and everything. But I don't have any exact numbers. What's your program and maintenance and, uh, to teens and smaller kids and adults? I mean, um, I think they probably do a few more adult programs than we do, um, but in terms of story times and things like that, I think based on our size, we do about the same level of service there. So. We are very fortunate to have that library, oper library operation in our area. Mm -hmm. and people are in there, so. Congratulations. Good month, good year. Ready? It's looking good so far. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on? To... Okay. You had 17 teen events? 17 um, people who attended a teen event. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought that was the number of that. Uh, how were they attended? You know, it depends on the topic. Um, things like the Nerf Wars, always very well attended. <laughs> Um, if we do something that's like money for college or basic budgeting or something like that, uh, we'll have between 5 and 15 people. If the schools get involved and offer extra credit, we'll get more. <laughs> um, so it, it really does vary based on the topic. It's probably hard to find things that we respond to. You know? it, it just depends, you know, and sometimes um, you're not sure, but it draws in a big crowd. Um, we actually had a, um, a tween, like a 10-year-old, say, hey, we'd like to make DIY squishies. Um, and so we, we did that, and that actually drew a pretty big crowd. So, um, a what? A squishy. So, sort of like stress balls, except they call them squishies now. Squishies? <laughs> yes. Thanks for trying. Of course. So Jocelyn, I just want to recognize Jandy, I think, is one of the creative forces back there in conceiving these programs, right? Mm-hmm. I marvel actually at the creativity that she applies in It's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, and I think Joanne and some of these um, teen craft programs, um, that's an area that she's very comfortable with and she's been drawing in a pretty good crowd. So, that's great. yes. And I have a question. Uh, I know you weren't here before when there was a needs assessment for the library, but mm -hmm. how do you think that your needs assessment is going to differ from what we've done previously? Okay, well, I'm not sure exactly what we've done previously, but I can tell you this one, um, I'm really looking forward to, because what it is looking at is not just, you know, what are issues in library services, looking at the community overall and saying, what are our concerns in our community, what are our needs in our community, and then looking at all of that data that comes in, we can tailor our library responses to that. So if we find that there aren't enough um, services for seniors or things for seniors to do in our community. Well, that's something that the library can take on and say, okay, how can we as a library, fitting within our purpose and our core services, help out our senior community? So I'm looking at that data overall as, as a community and saying, what are our needs there and how can the library as a part of our community help to fill those? So that's one part of that. And so we'll get that data. We'll create those strategic focuses as part of our strategic planning process. Strategic, strategic plan, which should tie in to city council's strategic plan. <laughs> um, and then the second part of that is sort of a space needs assessment, looking at library service currently, looking at the build out of the community and taking a look at our facility and saying, is the way we have it organized and laid out, does that fit what we need currently, what we anticipate we may need in the future, and then laying out um, some different options for future stuff. And they could come back and say, you guys are doing good. That's fine. That'd be great. Um, they could come back and say, you know, we think maybe you need to lay out a little bit more space for people to sit down and gather or some more space that you can utilize in different ways, things like that. So I think it'll be very interesting to see what they come back with. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jocelyn. Lisa. Over. Sure. 
Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Um, there were a couple things that I really wanted to touch on in this report today. Uh, the first, um, and you'll see there, you've got some reports on your desk related to the 2019 proposed docket and also a timeline and schedule for code amendments. And I'll talk you through uh, some details on, on those, uh, not too detailed. But um, first of all, the proposed docket. So um, among the items that we're going to need to address are um, we will need to be looking at updating our comprehensive plan maps to include the area that was annexed. And this is hot off the presses from the county. Um, uh, we just got this today, so this is our zoning map. Um, and but we do there, we do need to update our uh, the map 1.1, which is the the uh, boundary map, our cultural landmarks map, and we'll need to add both the new middle school and the new high school to that. Um, our the uh, police department's computer system already uh -huh. adapted for that, and the boundary annexation. <coughs> Yeah, we, we, we've been working with the county to make sure that that happened quickly. I, yeah. I'm actually really impressed that, oh, yeah. that they've great. turned it around that quickly. Yeah. Um, so Lisa, I really want to recognize the overlay of aerial photography very much helps understanding the utility of the map. Prior issues of the development code did not, for example, show like the imagery uh, as background. So very much appreciate the you know, satellite imagery-based map for the development code. Absolutely. And uh, just a little plug uh, later um, under uh, contracts, we do have the contract uh, to renew for our use of these aerial photographs. Um, and this map does reflect the 2018, just so you know. Um, so, and the other thing is that we, uh, city annexed areas map in the city street system will also need to be updated. Can we get one from Farmer's Market? You absolutely can. I'm actually, I'm actually putting, uh, putting in order, or collecting orders right now for the different maps. We have it just with the aerial. We have it with, with the zoning overlay. We have a straight zoning map right now. These are the ones that are available, and so we will be replacing maps in the city to reflect our true boundary. Um, oop, I skipped over one because the second one is. We do need to update our zoning ordinance as it relates to the zoning map. It's actually embedded in our zoning ordinance. So I have the maps, but we have to update the ordinance. And so that will be done as well. Also, the flood damage prevention ordinance. We do have, it's the last step that we need to do in order to be able to participate in the FEMA program. It is a model ordinance in Washington. It's one of your critical ordinances, so it actually really has to be done as part of your annual comp plan. Um, update. Um, um, also, we have uh, we have a little bit of code cleanup to do. So back in the <laughs> back in the, uh, um, when the code uh, ordinance two forty one was adopted, and we changed the requirements for type one, two, and three ordinances as it relates to the appeal. So the appeal is supposed to go to the superior court and not to council. And that's, that's throughout the code, it says that, but for one section, and it's one section in both, um, <coughs> both uh, the uh, River District SAP and the Development Code. So we just need to get that consistent with the rest of the code. Right now it suggests that, um, and it's really only in the noticing requirements for that. So it's just a, just a little uh, inconsistency. Also, you may remember, not long after I started here, um, we sent out um, a uh, memo to you regarding an adult, uh, adult living facilities and the fact that we have an RCW that says adult living facilities, and these are, these are just households. They're households that are set up for up to six um, uh, elderly people who are cared for. Their caretakers may be part of that, as long as it's set up as a residence. Um, it ha it's, has to be allowed in all residential and mixed-use zones. And so the, it's a simple change, really. We need to add the definition for adult uh, living facilities into our definition section. And we also simply need to put it as a permitted use in our um, zoning matrix. So, so does that RCW trump any laws that we have in the state with regards to home um, certain businesses being run out of the homes. I know we allow, you know, several, but 
being an adult family home would probably also be a business. It actually, it's actually not. Um, it, it actually, from a land use perspective, RCW treats it as a residence, and that's okay. what the code says. It's a single family residence, and so that's. Uh, um, I, I, they are required to be licensed um, uh, through the health department um, and the state. And I, I honestly don't know the answer whether it requires a business license or not, but through that process, I guarantee that the state will make sure that they yeah. have whatever licenses. Nice to make sure we didn't have any conflicting laws on our books. I wonder how the zoning would apply for uh, where HOAs are involved. Um, so, the, I, I actually, I actually know the answer to this, um, and it's not for us to answer because that is a civil matter. Uh, it's a, that's a contractual relationship between the property owner. However, there is case law that says that because state law says this is a single family residence, I don't think um, that the the uh, your CCMRs have not um, fared well in the courts on, on that. Uh, on that no, I, yeah, I was just curious about that because for 25 plus years, Betty and I were very involved with getting group homes started, things of sort here. And in most neighborhoods where they went in, they turned out to be better maintained property wise than a lot of the other things there. But this is the first time I've ever experienced where, where we have HOAs might come into play. Thank you. Lisa, yes. Are there any business license holders for adult family homes in our city right now? Um, so I don't know. I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that, that the reason why we did this last year was because we were approached by someone who was in the right. process of doing it. And as we researched it, we, we realized that our code didn't really stack up very well to uh, state law. Um, the next one, it has to do with electronically changeable reader board signs on public property. And so this came up, um, again, it was an administrative determination and it came up with the middle school because when you did the code amendments back in 2016, I believe, um, uh, you did provide that in the P zone and the O zone. Uh, the intent was for this to be allowed on public properties, but um, it wasn't contemplated in the River District as an example. And there's a simple, easy fix to say that this is allowed on all public properties throughout the city as long as it is monument style. So it would allow for, for the high school and for the new high school. But, well, the, yes, the high school, the high school already is such. But one of the things I will say, and so that's you'll see this with the next one also. Once there has been an administrative uh, interpretation made. What's supposed to happen, it doesn't appear to have happened in the past, but what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to follow up and incorporate it in your code and, and reflect it in your code. So this is, again, some code cleanup. Um, and that's the theme, by the way, of our update is all code cleanup. Uh, same thing with the chain link fence in the River District um, as it relates to it. So it should state that it is um, allowed for... Um, for uh, the, the vinyl coated chain link fences will be allowed on all sports facilities that are publicly owned or maintained. So um, it's not a carte blanche, but it, but it does um, clean that up. Um, and that, again, is consistent with the, with the interpretation that was done. Um, also, uh, this is a staff recommended um, code amendment. I, I, so right now, preliminary subdivision approvals are good for five years. And um, they can be extended for one three-year period. That's what the code allows right now. We have a number of relatively large subdivisions that are, that are actively being developed in a phase pattern. Um, one concern that we have is that we have uh, one that's about to expire. And if it expires, it, it, it's not going to do anybody any good to go back to square one. They've already had one extension. If it goes back to square one, they lose their entitlements. And because it's only a partially developed one and they have spoils piles all over the place, the concern is that, is that we want to keep this project moving forward. And so, um, in other communities um, where I've worked, um, it's pretty it's pretty standard to offer more than one extension provided 
that at, 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 during the period of the last extension, there was at least one additional phase platted. And so, obviously, it's still an active project. So, um, again, and the last one is also another code cleanup thing. So, throughout the throughout our development code, we have things that um, the planning and community development director, the P and CD director, it's not even consistent throughout the code, um, is required to do. Um, my recommendation is, given the structure that is in place today, that we change it to zoning administrator because the person who could be overseeing the Department of <coughs> Engineering and Building Services could be an engineer or it could be a planner. So the zoning administrator is the person who's responsible for the PEBS, for, uh, over, the director over PEBS, and or his her designee. And that, and that way it keeps it, 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 it'll refresh it in a way that you won't have to keep going back if you have, if uh, staff changes over time. So that, that is really the, the, the sum total of what uh, we're proposing to bring forward as part of the, um, uh, the code amendments. Um, yes? Uh, regarding the chain link amendment for sports facility, um, quickly thinking about what uh, our objectives are for fencing the upcoming public works yard, um, could you remind me what our objectives are for fencing on that project? So it, it does actually require, it, and it, so so it's a limited use in that zone, and it does require site obscuring fence. Okay. Uh, so so that's it's a little bit different. Uh, the river district specifically does uh, only allows this uh, the coated, mm -hmm. the vinyl coated chain link fence associated with ball fields in the R, in the in the residential zones. So not in the mixed use zones. And so that was just to say, you know what, if you have if you have a public facility with with sports fields anywhere in the river district, it would be appropriate to have those types of fences. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Are you about were you about ready to wrap? Um, I, so I was going to go to the the code uh, pipeline unless you wanted to unless you had some questions no, on that. Okay, thank you. Um, so the annual code amendments fit within a within um, a schedule. We have now a pretty aggressive um, code amendment schedule. Trying to process these in digestible uh, bites. You will be seeing the hearing on the tree ordinance at the next council meeting. I will have a comment response document and, and some potential of, uh, potential amendments uh, uh, presented as an errata sheet for your consideration. Um, so that'll be uh, on the 19th. The food truck ordinance, um, I have a draft that I'm going to be workshopping with the Planning Commission uh, next week. And uh, we, will, uh, we will extend an invitation to both uh, the food truck, or the, I'm sorry, the um, the uh, beverage uh, uh, facilities and the, um, as well as the, the brick and mortar uh, restaurants that had had previously opposed it, so that we'll have it'll be a good discussion. Um, I am proposing, as we talked about, because you had asked that we fast track it, that once that that we will be um, after this workshop and and I get some feedback from planning commission, we'll immediately go to the 60-day commerce notice so that we can hear this in May. Um, also, um, next week, um, the Planning Commission will be taking their second deep dive into the site design review workshop. And this came out, it came about because there's some inconsistencies between our code and what the comp plan says. And as we took a deeper dive, we found that it's really going to actually improve the process quite a bit. So we improve Clarity of expectation for our developers, and that's always a good thing. So the one that I want you to be aware of is the 4G, 5G wireless. Um, so we did do workshop that last month um, on a high level with the Planning Commission. We received the application for a franchise agreement from uh, Verizon Wireless. Now that starts, starts a, shot, a shot clock, excuse me, 120-day shot clock that we have to approve that franchise agreement. Um, it's stopped right now because it was not complete, but um, for what I heard from uh, Verizon on Friday was that they should have that information to me in a couple days. 
Uh, I was hoping that it would be a month or two, but <laughs> uh, you do what you can do. Um, why this is time sensitive? So once they have the franchise agreement, if they turned around and submitted an application for a, a small cell, um, the following day, if we don't have any code in place, we don't have any standards for approval or denial. So, so this is so this is going to be another hot one, and, and it's taken a deep dive. We're we're doing the research now. Um, we will be. Um, uh, I want to. And it's going to take probably a few workshops I, um, with planning commission. I hope to have it coming forward to you um, in July. Uh, so right now the the shot clock runs through the end of July, but it'll get delayed a little bit. And I think that as long as we can, it, as long as it's on the docket, um, I think that we will we'll be in will be in good shape. Um, but it, we have no choice but to move forward. So I've kind of timed the annual code comp plan amendments, even though they're mostly cleanup. Um, uh, timed it to, to work around these other things that are already in the pipeline. Um, we are also uh, working with um, uh, a group um, of practitioners right now, looking at our landscape uh, code, and we will be updating that. But and that's also pushed out to uh, to begin workshopping with the planning commission based upon the other stuff we have online and. Hopefully by the end of summer we can get to looking at our parking standards. So that's that kind of gives you the big picture. The H's are the hearings. Uh, blue is planning commission. Green is city council. Yes, sir. Uh, some of these, some people are following some of these very closely. I'm wondering if we can get this posted on our site so people are aware of kind of the timelines. Yeah, absolutely. And what I do want to say, I did this in months, but I do want to say this also just for if, just for your clarity of expectations, that I will do my best to hold to this schedule, but it, there's a lot involved with this, and, and we, may get, we may end up having to have some extra workshops at the planning commission level or at the council level, so, um, but yes, we can do that. Thank you. And that is it for me, unless um, I did want to share with you just, uh, if you have just a minute, a couple updates from Scott Bernard. Um, Number one, uh, Harvard Road widening. Good news, we've received the 30% design, yay. And we're, we're um, uh, so 60% design is uh, due in May. Uh, and the overlay, we're preparing the 90% design documents for submittal to WashDOT. So that's moving forward. Um, uh, Parametrics is preparing bid documents for the pavilion at Orchard Park. And the signal at Signal and Appleway, we're wait, waiting for the weather to turn on the signal. So um, we are also evaluating what it takes to move the, the uh, controller box. And the signal at Madsen and Appleway should go to bid in the next two weeks. Um, Northfield parking lot and maintenance trail preliminary uh, plans uh, were reviewed last week. And we're, they're heading to final design and we're looking to probably do the work in August. Um, and finally, public works yard permits uh, are complete, and they're just waiting for the ground to thaw to move uh, some dirt. Excellent. Yes, I wanted to talk uh, real quickly about, I had a chance to talk with Kitty a little bit more about the um, signal at signal. And Kitty <coughs> had a great idea, you know, because naturally we have the box concern, but then you also have the cars that are going to turn left versus the cars that are going to turn right, and she had a great idea, more for the council's knowledge base, to offset. Um, so kind of offset back a little bit further. The people want to take a left, you're staggering it for the so that people want to take a right, so they're not obstructed <coughs> on to you. So it's a great idea, but I want to give kudos to Katie um, for bringing that idea up because I think it's really helpful. So have the left turn people back. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. So there goes Katie. Like Legacy Ridge doing it. Yeah, it's a great idea. Um, I, I've had a lot of people volunteer to come out with spray cans, spray paint cans, and just paint the lines every day until <laughs> it gets warm for the permit. <laughs> They're really anxious to get that light going. Okay, I think I, I thought or, or yeah, I actually appreciate that. At least I'll get with you afterwards. We don't have time to address it today. But then, Mr. Mayor, I do have a question if I can. Lisa, on the street ordinance, on uh, uh, part of this is you, but part of this is probably going to be the general. I, I know that on the 19th, you gave us the recommendation on there, and the Planning Commission held several workshops. The Parks and I had one workshop, 
he gave a recommendation from, from the planning aspect of it. I would assume by this next, the 19th, Jen, that we'll have some report from Parks and Art and their recommendation on that. Yes, I believe I'm scheduled uh, to be on the agenda for tomorrow. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I just have one, one question. Uh, I was with Chris when uh, we were touring for Tina over the weekend, and I hadn't been back there for some time, and it's really developing very nicely. Uh, but as we were leaving, uh, you know, I guess it's Indiana and Harvard Road. Uh, Wellington. To, Wellington. 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 Wellington, is it? Okay. Uh, anyway, trying to exit uh, on the Harvard Road is a real challenge. It really is. And I, I don't know, um, I don't recall whether or not we have provided for that in our transportation improvement plan. Is anybody remember? Yes, actually, actually, um, that is a requirement on Greenstone as it relates to River Crossing East, and they have plans to um, do improvements on it. Katie? So, yeah, so the one to the north, if I'm make sure I know my streets right. That's the street to the north is Indiana. That will be no. That's that's well Wellington. Yeah, Wellington. Wellington goes into the Chichester. Okay, so Wellington, but the, there's a road that hasn't been punched through yet. I think that's Indiana. Yeah, that's so when impressive. Indiana crosses Harvard, there will be a roundabout, and where Wellington crosses Harvard, there'll be a traffic signal. All that's going to be built with um, by the developer. And, and, I, and my understanding is that, that, that they're looking at moving uh, those forward this year. Great. I, I was just going to ask the question, so it's, we're assuming it's going to be this year that we're trying to happen? You know, it's driven by the developer, but if Indiana, they've, they've graded it out. If they pave it and put the intersection in, it could be a, a project this year. Very good. Okay. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together to speak of, to listen to, to listen to, and to make and to take actions about this place we call home. Inspiring us imagination and wisdom to listen and to act. Amen. 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 to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I ask to uh, excuse Council Member Sievers due to illness? Second. Mayor, move the agenda. Security to hold them back. But with that said, I'm going to take just a brief opportunity um, to make a couple of comments because we kind of, uh, with the transition of the year, right, um, we passed out um, attaboys basically, you know, uh, and yearly ter terms of service. One of the things that we have done over the years past, and, and we mentioned it at, at, uh, uh, at the first of the year, was that we have an employee of the year across the board. And uh, so the, the four departments had uh, significant accomplishments with the individuals that were recognized. But the employee of the year for this two th 2018 was Dennis Scott. Mm -hmm. So Dennis, now I have an official plaque. <laughs> So we finally got it. We got enough money to put together to get an official <laughs> plaque. 
And uh, I, again, I wanted to highlight just a couple of things that Dennis has done for us in the last year or two years or a long time. But last year was Orchard Park, significant challenges. Liberty Lake Road had significant challenges. Uh, when he did Town Square, he was, he was there at Town Square. I think the one that uh, highlight, I think, of, of Dennis, Dennis's accomplishment last year was getting rid of the drug house that we had. I mean, yeah, that was, he's, if you wanted a bulldog, this is a guy that you want on your side because he chased those people down and got that house basically turned over to the city. And when we did run the auction, which I think, did you do the auction? No, Brian did. Brian did. Oh, Chief, the Chief. Chief did. Chief did the auction, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. He, he had the gun. <laughs> hey, you're doing a nice top dollar for that. Top dollar. Well, that's a, that's the point. I mean, we got what fifty some thousand dollars. Yeah, double what we double what we did. Absolutely. Right. Okay. <clears throat> that's because of Dennis. I think he he got us more money out of that house than he took out of us for pay. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. you. Okay, both of you look no this way. Okay. Go there you ahead. go. Thank you very much. I would just like to say uh, I've worked for the city for, I think, five years now. And as a part-time employee, uh, this is really a very special award. Uh, I am humbled and honored by it, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. So Mayor, Council Members, I want to just give you a quick update about the Library Board and library activities in general. Um, you're aware that the uh, request for proposal has gone out for the Community Needs Assessment and Library Master Plan. I just want to like, <clears throat> let you know that the uh, responses have come in, are, are about to come in. The deadline to receive questions has passed and the proposals are due by the end of the day on March 15th. So this is moving right along. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, you might recall that, I believe it was the last year, or late 2017, that we, the library team published a welcome brochure. And I just want to let you know that the under the direction of, of Jocelyn, Director Jocelyn, um, <clears throat> that brochure is being revised. And generally, it's just to make it the language more welcoming. Um, Friends of the Library had a silent auction for Valentine baskets, as happens every year. And $900 was raised. That I think, I don't recall if that's a record, but it was really good. So, And the, the Friends want to thank the community for um, participating and being enthused. Um, the Library Board, I mentioned this from time to time, one of our major uh, objectives is to review policies and make sure that we, they're current, they're smart, they're in keeping with whatever changes have happened in the library. So that is ongoing. We review policies each and every meeting and um, gen generally make at least small revisions. So we continue to do that and the emphasis is on um, promoting a great patron experience and on efficiency. So uh, that's the end of my report, unless you have questions. Okay. Thank you. Parks and Art. Planning Commission. For the Lake Sewer and Water. <coughs> oh, All right. Uh, Bill Genoway with the uh, Liberty Lake Water and Sewer District. <clears throat> well, we have two really big job construction jobs for next season for us. It's the Green Ridge Water System Consolidation Project and 
phase two of the east side uh, water systems. Uh, you know, for a small district, this is big stuff. So for east side, we're looking at two and a, about $2.7 million. But with the magic that uh, By J. Adams does at our district, we was able to whittle that down to $855,000 for the citizens. And it's going to it's going to be the difference between having good water and really bad water. So that's that's lines and tanks and the whole system. <clears throat> East side same way. It's two hundred. It's two. It's two point six million, and we got that down to a, about a million three, and that's through grants and loans, and some forgiveness and some magical stuff. So we're pretty proud of the boys at the water district. And on another note, this is just some historical stuff. I worked for the city of Spokane for many years. <clears throat> we were doing a um, CSO, Combined Sewer Overflow, on the north side. It's the first one we did. And there was a small engineering firm in town that really impressed us. And we gave them, <clears throat> I think, their first major sewer job. Mike Taylor, Dennis Scott. <laughs> that was probably 40 years ago give or take. <laughs> the other thing I have to say is our snow plowing business around here is pretty good. I mean, it's, um, I've seen some bad snow plowing. This is amazing with a small crew. I, I realize you don't have a lot of lane miles, but those guys are out there all the time. So, Katie, give kudos to your guys. And then the, uh, I was watching the news the other day, and I saw the police chief jump into Liberty Lake, and I thought, well, that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Hey, Bill. 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 Before you go away. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I had a question going to you. Are you planning any major uh, water line or line construction uh, by Altec? Altec, where the kind of where oh, the, the RV center is between the RV center and Altec. I don't think so. You don't think so? We, we can serve with some of the lines that we have there. <coughs> we are doing some work out at the uh, new, the new college or the new uh, high school is in uh, consolidated, so we're not, but we have a little piece of that. It, it's kind of more of a, uh, they can't quite get to it, we can, so we're going to do that. Okay. <coughs> so. Mike was a little bit. He didn't know it was literally like sewer water, but the sewer line and water line are even electrified. So I don't know. Who's this? Okay. So maybe you want to check on that. Okay. Anyway, thank you. Sure. Could you give Dennis a plaque on me? How are you doing? You just gave him a lot of money. Okay. Other reports? We had the fire district earlier, so. We're going to go on city council reports. Any city council reports? Yeah. Um, I'll take one. The Saturday of last weekend was the Father Daughter Dance at the Mirabu Park Hotel. Um, 500 people <laughs> in attendance. Uh, combinations of um, fathers and daughters. Um, great event. I'd say a really memorable event. One of the largest that the organization has presented. Um, I marveled standing there making cotton candy and handing that out. Willy Wonka was the theme. I marveled for a moment at what I thought was what this event is like creating opportunities for people to be better parents in terms of spending time with their kids. And I reflect on that as like, those are the most valuable contributions you can provide in terms of a service opportunity. And I compare that directly to actually the great stuff that goes on at our library in terms of creating opportunities to build stronger families in the community. Um, stronger, fam stronger families and stronger community. So great stuff happening. It was a great event. Uh, also on Saturday, uh, I'll, I'll jump back a little bit. A few months ago, the Splash did an excellent article on the Guild School. And those are, you aren't familiar with the Guild School. It's a program, it's a facility that helps kids that have mental illness or disability issues that need extra help. And currently they're up on the north side by uh, Glover or Shadow Park area. And it's just, they're kind of exceeding their capacity and they're looking for a new facility. So their goal is to build a new facility in the university district. Um, that would meet the needs of more kids. And it learned from the article that was written in the Splash, there was actually a family, a local family in Liberty Lake that didn't realize that that was available, so they were able to contact the Guild School and take advantage. So for even one family to benefit from that article is phenomenal. So thank you to the Splash for doing that article. Um, but on Saturday night at the Convention Center, they had a auction, a uh, fundraising uh, dinner, 
uh, extremely well attended. It was packed at the convention center uh, for the uh, live auction, and they raised a ton of money for the program. So I was able to attend that as well as council member receivers, and just a really neat event overall. And getting to hear from some of the kids that had benefited from that program. So great, great attendance. I couldn't take my daughter to the Father God event, so she was my date for that that night. So <laughs> it was a neat event. Uh, real quick, so um, <clears throat> just sort of want to run, run this by the rest of the council. So the um, British Booking Valley Chamber of Commerce. Um, they have some sub network groups within their within their organization. And there's a Liberty Lake Network that meets, uh, I think, every other Thursday, the second and fourth Thursdays of the, the month here in Liberty Lake, a breakfast type of thing. There's several businesses that, that belong to that to just kind of network and share ideas. Um, so since it's local and since luckily I finally work for a company who's extremely supportive of my, um, my duties here as council, I really um, I'd like to go to the next meeting, which I think is on the 14th, kind of check it out. And hopefully, you know, get your guys' support to no cost to us um, to join that network to help you know, continue to get feedback from the local businesses for us here on council. So, um, hopefully, nobody objects. I just kind of want to let you know what my intentions were. Katie, isn't that the meeting that's going to start meeting here? Right. So, Linda McKinley, I think is her name. Right. She works for Windermere. They came in and had a conversation with Jen and I, and they're going to use the council chambers on. I think it's the second and fourth Thursdays at 7.45. And they, right now there's about 15 members and they're trying to grow. So, great opportunity. Twice a month and um, they're looking forward to having their meetings right here. Yeah. Look forward to getting, you know, consistent and good feedback from the businesses as to how we can help them grow and assist. Great. Mr. Mayor, yes, I have if one of my say last week, Scott Bernard and I happened to both attend the, the uh, Spokane Valley Chamber of Commerce luncheon for talk to uh, us about an update from the county on transportation, things of the sort here. And one of the things also they discussed was the new budget coming up, possibly uh, higher tax on our gas, things of the sort here. And then it immediately got into the conversation of the bridge that was going to be built, was proposed between Oregon and Washington State. And that the design alone ran in excess of $400 million for that. And then when it came in, uh, near the f finish, they discovered it was 17 feet off in the design. So when they made the corrections, which brought it up to approximately $500 million, the legislature looked at that and, by repeating what was told to us, had said, that's ridiculous, we're not going to prove something like that. So they scrapped it. It's done. So the bottom line that came out of the meeting was this, that for citizens, when they hear this type of stuff, be aware of what goes on. And just don't sit back when you hear something like this. Write or call your legislators and say, this is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous that something like that happened. Um, it's taxpayers' money, and I think what happens with a lot of individuals will look at this and go, well, it's okay, you know, it's, it's not affecting me. It does. It affects all of us. But to think about that kind of money, and one individual there in the meeting said, well, if you say it real fast, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. I don't care how fast you say it, it was a lot of money. But to be 17 feet off in a design, and you know what? They kept the individuals who did the design for the next step they're looking at. Is this the Sears? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that was it. There's a, I was in Olympia. It's just a little segue. You know. Is there yeah. Olympia last week? And uh, the transportation meeting was about uh, revenues and expenditures. So the Harvard, Harvard Barker is still uh, included in the Senate in House transportation packages. Um, they're moving forward. It's a seventeen billion dollar billion, like in the B, the B. Uh, billion dollar package. A seven hundred seven. Five billion is in carbon fees, and this was three, two, two point five billion is in bonds. So about ten billion dollars in carbon fees and bonds, and then there's some gas tax and other things. Um, it's uh, so they're looking at 
do things a little bit, hopefully, differently. But you know, again, it's uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, it's, the, it's the universal uh, signage where you have the CBC with the red, red splash through it, <laughs> like no parking here. <laughs> right. But it was a, it's a very interesting uh, package going towards Senator Hobbs, Senator King. Uh, they deserve a lot of credit. Um, at least uh, trying to move projects forward. One thing about the, the transportation package is all the it is taxes and fees and things like that. It's also, you know, that seventeen million is actually put, put the expenditures on on infrastructure, which are jobs. So they, Anticipate to get 65,000 plus jobs out of the, the deal. So, very interesting uh, week. And then they had to get all their stuff done coming by Friday. They were trying to get a lot of stuff done by Friday. So, uh, we'll see. Yeah. And one more <coughs> in case you guys drive on Pines, uh, North from I 90. Uh, Apex Cannabis, the applicant in Liberty Lake, has updated their billboard. It now clearly advertises their locations. Spokane, Moses Lake, and Liberty Lake. Okay, any other reports? Thanks for having me. I'm sorry. I was a shock. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Mayor and Member of the, of the Council. Um, I want to call up uh, Stephen to give us an update on snow. We call him our snow fighter. And I put him at the front of the agenda because I'm sure he wants to go home and go to bed because he's working, yeah. been working around the clock for the last month. But as he walks up there very slowly, I'm going to tell you that the lights on Country Vista are LED. So that came up last week when we took ownership of the street lights on Country Vista, that they are LED. So, Stephen? Good evening, everyone. Um, as you know, my February was not exactly slow, so we've been busy. Uh, we've had a few comments regarding ice in neighborhoods. Um, you know, we are assessing situations daily. We had a guy go out today and do some cleanup in some areas where ice was causing, let's just say, a lot of potholes in the roads. They were getting rough. Uh, majority, I think we've got a very nice freeze thaw that's going to be happening here over the next couple of weeks, so, you know, that will be... Um, melting our ice and give a chance to freeze and our water to get off the road before it really causes issues. Um, we do rely on the police quite a bit during the winter for accidents. Chief, I'm happy to hear there was only seven in February. I'm actually going to kind of really pleased with that because we've done something right. So um, I am working on an update for what our total costs are. And Chris, at the same time, I know you asked for a uh, Kind of a short demo of our three mobile our mobile three one one management software system. Yeah. I hadn't forgot about you. I was just kind of <laughs> apparently somebody did, but <laughs> I was just kind of waiting to get some good data. And I will probably be coming in in April with kind of what our costs are, where we were at, how much we spent, um, man hours. Right now we're sitting right around eighty five thousand, but I am obviously waiting in for more bills to come in. I got some fuel bills, some equipment cost bills that are coming in. So, other than that, you know, February is quite the month. Uh, we've had a lot of drifting in areas lately. That's been probably the biggest one. Um, if you live over in the River District, Harvest Parkway, as you can see, the berms are not short right now, particularly on the one side or along Country Vista. So, um, I always thought maybe you could share some of the trails that you've had to create and they actually I saw loaders, the front end oh. loaders out on Sprague and Valley Way. Yeah, so our trail equipment's gotten a little bit bigger, namely our streets equipment. Some of the drifts along Sprague, Valley Way, they were four or five foot deep and even our loaders were pecking their way through it in a sense to get through it, but we have gotten some of those open, some of the trails we've actually had to move two roads just because the drifts are so bad that I mean, it's it's been a month. That's what I would say. Yes, Shane. I really want to compliment you and your crew. I know you guys have been working tirelessly to make sure our city's taken care of. So thank you and your crew and yourself for all the work you guys have put into the city. Okay. Um, and I really want to encourage the citizens of the city to uh, be cognizant that you know we're only a couple of years in, really a year in yes. to 
taking control of this snow removal ourselves, and it's a learning process, and we're doing the best that we can as a city, and they've done a phenomenal job as a crew, and sometimes it's like law enforcement, you're darned if you do, you're darned if you don't, and people are going to have criticism <coughs> either way, so I really want to compliment your crew on that. I think we've learned a lot of great things out of this, and one of the things that Steve and I were talking about was looking at some of the other cities and what they've done with it. What was the device that you had? Uh, It's referred to as a snow gate. A snow gate that blocks up driveways. Spokane. And, Spokane has done it. And yes. Some cities have done it successfully, others have not, and just assessing if that's something we need to look at in the future and how much more time that's going to put on the crews and things to that effect. Uh, so just different things that we can look at in the future, but great job for your entire crew. Phenomenal work. Thank you. I'll make sure to pass that on to them. Yes, Chris. A question, maybe Katie, too, because I think you're the one who maybe returned the call. There's a comment on Facebook about um, some icy spots, I guess, in the River District, maybe over the, earlier this week. And thank you so much for responding. To, I guess the person did call City Hall and you, you called back. So what? how do we handle, I know there's there's certain intersections that we de-ice all the time. Yes. And I know the officers, I, I think, are pretty good about letting you know if there's other intersections. But how do... They, they got the initial impression that, no, well, there are certain intersections we do, and that's it. We don't de-ice anything else. Well, how do we handle so, those? It's a great question, and I'll take a stab at it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so we have protocol, and basically we tackle our arterials and our collectors first, um, hills and drifting, uh, keeping the city open for emergency vehicle, police, fire, etc. Then we'll go into the neighborhoods when we get about four inches, which is kind of the damned if you do, damned if you don't. The, the phones start ringing to Jan and her crew when we go into the, the residential neighborhoods. Um, do the best we can. It's hard because of the driveways, because of the parked cars, narrow, et cetera, et cetera. And where does the snow go? It has to go into berms. And so we tackle that. What's happened this year, the phone call that I got was from a very nice woman. She was second year. Um, having a winter, living in Spokane during the winter, um, over she was from California, Seattle, and then Spokane, um, and she just wanted to know what to expect. A very, very nice worry. And so let me share with you what I shared with her. Um, it was good for me to go out and look at what she was describing because I was surprised that the streets over the River District were curb to curb ice for the whole block. And then I thought, well, that is strange, because usually what you get is um, a, a broken snow floor, so to speak, and you get it chunky. It wasn't chunky, it was solid ice. But then, I have to tell you, I went over to River District, and I saw the same thing. I went down Settler in the Homestead neighborhood, Scott and I saw the same thing. So what they were experiencing over there is consistent throughout our city. If we have something that I will call it treacherous and dangerous, um, we'll go out and assess it, but right now, the only way to fix this solid ice thing is mechanical or chemical, and there is, it's not something we could manage because it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think she felt better, maybe, perhaps, in that it was everywhere. <laughs> um, so she's in good company with other people, but you just have to drive safely, and like Stephen was saying, our, our police officers, you know, give us that reinforcement of, People need to drive for the conditions, and so it is slippery out there. It is icy, and really, it's very difficult to do anything about that. The freeze thaw as it kicks in, um, we can scrape down a little bit. Um, if intersections are overly treacherous, I'd say we could add sand or salt, whichever yeah. the crew decides. So that's kind of, you know, residentials are toughest. The good news in Liberty Lake, though, is if you're in a residential area, probably only have to drive two or three blocks to get to an arterial. And then it's good. So, yeah. Yeah, and thanks for your quick response. Sorry for the long answer. It's okay. no. and, and as Katie says, you know, it, it's a very short distance between collectors and arterials. And as traffic is flowing down those streets, you'll notice usually one side of intersections is kind of bare and the other side's not. That's due to the magnesium chloride that's getting tracked into the intersections and through that area, which does help keep it unthawed. Um, cars are, you know, people are habit forming so as you cut a corner it's just standard habit that they cut that corner it's pretty easy to see where the mag goes and and our priorities they have changed a little bit there's been a few areas that weren't on our list that we've added to um, certain conditions you know when it does get slick we've got a few hills that connect down to a few collectors that we've begun um, salting 
over the times in order to help clear that up to prevent some accidents. Okay. So. Thanks. Steve, the magnet referred to, that's only good down to a certain temperature, is it? doesn't get to a point where it's not effective at a yeah. certain temperature. Yes, the, if you go off of what they say, it's about 5 degrees. Right. If you go off of actual environment, you really notice it about 15. Mm -hmm. So 15 is, they say it's working, and but it's you know kind of like molasses, really slow. So, I, I mean, it's so 15 is where I kind of cut it, so that way we're not out there wasting product. Unless it really calls for it, then we can go out. Yeah, I think it's important for some of the citizens, maybe, to also realize that. I can recall back... Years ago in Spokane, they had a really rough winter, and they made a decision to go out and, and start putting the chemical out. And the next day, it got below a certain temperature, and they had really wasted all that money because mm -hmm. it was totally ineffective at that point. Yeah, and there are times that that's going to happen, and then there's other times that, like the drifting, we went out and put some de ice down on some drift areas. That was the worst thing we could have done because the snow comes across, it melts. It dilutes, then the water just refreezes it. Freezes. So I mean, we're almost better off just to leave it dry if it is dry or wait till the drift is done and then just cake it with salt because the salt is is another you know de-icing agent but it right. works a little bit better at colder temperatures very good well, i'll tell you what you know that's the smartest decision we made hired you but getting this crew out there with those with the big equipment so thank you very much appreciate thank you appreciate that anything else go no. get some sleep yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Mr. Mr. Harris, I, I thought you said Dennis Scott was the best thing we ever did. <laughs> <laughs> See, Dennis, how, how quickly we forget. <laughs> <laughs> you got your plaque, now we're on to Stephen. Stephen's working on his plaque. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> right he's, doing doing it. It. he's a great he lobbyist. He's about a plaque a year. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to just pick up my pace a little bit. And Harvard and Henry are joining me on an update, but things are going well. And I have to say that Scott Bernhardt is working to try to get the legislature, both the Senate and the House, information. And nothing new to report, but um, I am providing all of you information from our legislature, or excuse me, our lobbyists, which I find very helpful. So hopefully you're enjoying that as well. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, the advanced agenda tracking sheet. So that is what's in your packet under number 13. Um, I'll just pick it up and hand it. This is kind of a document that I think council asked for probably the first year or two that I started. And it's kind of what's in the queue. And so it's our way of keeping track of things that come up. Um, sometimes things will drop off of here because they're no longer needed. Um, I'll give you an example. For instance, I think when we set this out, we were thinking of having a joint meeting with a uh, valley, that's no longer the case. So it's very fluid and it's a planning document. Um, it's just a way to keep, it's kind of like your shopping list. It's a way to keep track of things that uh, are in the queue. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, moving down, salary commission questionnaire. My understanding, RJ is um, not here tonight, but he wanted me to remind all of you that your questionnaires are due this Friday, March 8th. And then, let's see. Report. Okay. Redaction item. Oh, real quick. So, Katie, I know this uh, our next meeting we have precision cutting technologies coming in. It would be really great if we could get get them to shovel their sidewalk before they come in. They're also going to ask them that question. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, they go on to the networking meeting and you can have that conversation. Just looking at the building. I don't think they have to shovel Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, Mayor, I do have one other thing real quick. Um, I apologize for being a little bit late to the, um, the workshop. I had stopped by and saw Scott Damons, whose wife, Marilyn, had passed away in the, in the accident. The reason why I'm bringing it up is we are going to talk about a memorial event with her. Um, John L. Scott was her employer, and we're looking for a kind of a, a walkathon at some point in time. And so doing a permanent memorial and have a walkathon, so... That those are in the queue and probably right. later in the spring or summer. Right. So right. just wanted to mention this. Okay, excellent. Mayor, move back to the same agenda 1 and 2 to approve February 19, 2019 City Council minutes to approve March 5, 2019 vouchers in the amount of $417,364.66. Second. Move and second. Discussion? Not here, you'll have to say aye. 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 Opposed? Move general business number one to approve on-call agreement with AAA Sweeping and First Street 
sweeping services in the amount not to exceed seventy thousand annually, and top areas Mary Peterson to enter into the agreement. Second. Okay, so discussion. Discussion, please. I noticed on the, the, the documents that were completed and filed with our reports, uh, their bid looks like uh, the, the title of the form is basis of bid. And it comes in at a grand total of $30,040. And it, it doesn't tell me a whole lot, so I'm going to depend on you to tell me more about that if you don't mind, Katie. And our work. And then why are we looking not to exceed 70, which is two and a half times more than their bid amount? Yeah. So the basis of the bid is, so when we sent it out for bid, everybody had the exact same thing as what they were bidding on. The contract does state that that is not going to be um, a payment amount, it is strictly for bidding purposes. So last year, if you remember, we came to you and asked for a contract for street sweeping in the amount of $35,000 last year. When Andrew and I were going through and looking at the amount what to put on the original contract, we felt 35000 was a comfortable amount. We actually burnt through that first 35000 just into single sweeping. So after talking with Andrew, we decided to double the amount to 70000 because normally what we do is we do a, a full city sweep in the spring, and then each month we do a collector's and arterial sweep. Um, and then in the fall, we do another full city suite. With the spring we've had, usually your amounts are higher because you've got more dirt and grime on the road, cars are tracking rocks and everything else. It gets less and less time and less and less expensive over the course of a summer. So we're hoping the 70000 is sufficient enough to cover all of the months that we do sweeping, which I think is a total of six or seven months. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. The thirty thousand on the grand total. What does that represent? One sweep? No, that is strictly. We anticipate. Um, let me have. It. It's one hundred fifty hours, one hundred fifty units of regenerative air sweeper. Yes. And it is twenty units of water truck. Yes. So some companies too, if they're only anticipating ten hours, they give you this rate. If they're anticipating, say, 150 hours, they give you a little bit better rate because they know you're going to keep their machines busier. So 150 hours, I feel, is on the lower end, which is where I came up with that number, hoping to get a little bit better price on hourly rate for the machine. If I could also clarify, so for bidding purposes, the quantities they priced out were 30000 30, the contract is a not to exceed 70000 Correct. And it would only be used, we would only use 70000 if it was if it was necessary to do the work. Yeah. If, Based on what we did last year, it sounds like that's about how much quantity we used. We could have bid on 70000 um, The other thing I should mention, though, we only got one bid. We did. And this is the same company that did our, did our work last year. Yes. And they're also on the state contract. Yes, they're very, I honestly, I see every state using them. Washington, Idaho, they're a very reputable company. And Spokane Valley, don't they use the same? Yes, they do. Spokane Valley is one of their um, sure. contractors. Okay, well, the only comment I would have then, sir, is if you would, in the future, uh, let's bid the actual amount and not some some preconceived number to make it, whatever, you, whatever the thought process was, because you... you Make this document, and then you ask us to spend up to seventy thousand. Start perpetuating the type of questions that I have tonight about it. So we could just do it one way all the time, and we know exactly what we're bidding on the amount. So really, what we're looking at then is really the per hour cost, and not that total. Is yeah, it, it, it's just a right? it's a per hour cost. Like I said, if so, we leave that thirty. Of there, you know, we're, we're approving it per hour cost up to 70. Okay. 70, okay. yes. Stephen, is there a minimum threshold? No, no, okay, no. Because <laughs> they go out there for an hour, they get paid 150 bucks. Or whatever. Yes, that like I said, it, it, it was my, my thought and stuff was behind if, if I'm a contractor and I'm only going to get 10 hours 
of work, I'm going to charge more than somebody that's going to give me 150 hours worth of work. Right. So that's really like I said, where that number came from. Okay. So. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Discussion. Aye. Aye. I move to our business number two to authorize the mayor to execute the Spokane County imagery license agreement for the period 2019 through 2021. Second. Any for the discussion? I hear you all in favor say aye. Aye. Here we go. Resolution number 19254. City of Liberty Lakes, Spokane County, Washington, Resolution Number 19-254, a resolution adopting a public arts policy and procedures for the City of Liberty Lake, Washington. Mayor, move resolution number 19-254. Second. Discussion? Not here, did he? We'll take a vote on resolution 19-254. All in favor, raise your right hand. I count for six out of six, correct? Introduction of upcoming items, Katie. Mayor and Council, our next meeting is March 19th. We will have a local business spotlight on precision cutting. We also have a public hearing on the street tree ordinance and the first read. And then also, we would like to bring back the, um, let's see, oh, this is the discussion on the lookout page and the content of that lookout page. So this is something that came up. Uh, in January, I think Councilmember Kavinskis and other people weighed in, so we want to bring that back for discussion. So that will be a workshop at the 7 o'clock meeting. Okay, citizen comments. We're back at the big boobies. You have an opportunity, you have one last opportunity. How do we to close it? <coughs> oh, we'll close the citizen comments. Thank you. Oh, one thing I would like to do. for the uh, uh, panel and stuff, looking at Trevin. What I'd like to recommend, and I would hope that we can maybe see if we can work it in on this, if the council goes along with this, on the 19th, to have a discussion of council. What are we expecting of those individuals? One concern I have, that if we get a committee formed and not give them direction, such as a dollar amount or something like that, we, Lord only knows what is going to come to us in recommendation. My concern is that we don't give them some parameters to work with, a dollar amount. And RJ has done this for us in the past where we could come up with a dollar amount and I'm just going to grab a figure, let's say it's $3 million or two. And he can look at this and say, okay, if that's what we were going to spend in Trailhead, how would we pay for that and where does the money come from? And then we could settle on a dollar amount that we could be comfortable with and then we could give them a parameter to work with. Without that, I think there's a good possibility we're going to see some possibly grandioso things come in, of which we're going to look and say, I'm sorry, that is something we can't do. And I think that what that shows to the committee is that we're not paying attention to, to give them some direction. So I hope we would do that as soon as possible. I, I'm curious of the council's thoughts on yeah, that. I'd like, I'd like to see those numbers, um, like, like you said. Yeah. I, I, I would hate for the, the Trailhead project to come in as this, you know, everybody's dream um, facility when really we're looking at what we really need to look at is the function. What 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 are the functions that we need that building? And we're talk really just talking about the building in my mind. Maybe other people have other conceptions, but what are the functions that we need that building to serve? And how do we get there without, you know, throwing in, you know, a, a three-story all glass and steel right. building with you know, I, I just no. I think it sounds great, but you know, it's going to pay for it. Um, you know, I just I don't want it to end up being everybody's you know dream come true, or we really need to keep it to function. Farm follows function. I guess you got to decide what you want. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I myself a comment on that. I 
thought we decided that city council would constitute the committee. Uh, and that uh, we were the ones who were really going to determine what we were going to do at Trailhead. Can I make a reference to that? Yes. Two meetings ago that did come up and I made the comments that I would like to be on that. You wanted to be on that committee. Hugh wanted to be on it and Odie said it's going to be on it. The last meeting that Dennis made a comment and, and I agree with it is that it's going to come to us eventually and I don't really see a need that we need to be on that if we get the committee and give them direction and we're posted each time that they have meetings I, I, I'm comfortable with that the only reason that I was insisting that I wouldn't be involved is because of the fear I have that I mentioned earlier if we don't have some direction there from this council I'm fearful what's going to come back is something we can't afford because I've already heard from individuals who put their name forward to be on that on that uh, committee mm -hmm. that they want to build a bridge over this highway from the 22 acres we own. They want to have two restaurants, things of the sort here. Now, great ideas, but if it's not affordable, then we need to look at that, say, hey, we appreciate that, but let's be realistic what we're going to be looking at. I think we can probably do that. I think we can probably come up with some dollar amount to allocate to it, preliminarily anyway. I think that's all. Is it possible to have it on the 19th? Yeah, it's all we'll get together. Lisa and I and Scott will get together and try to develop a strategy on what to bring back. Generally, and I, I totally agree with you, I think managing expectations is key and we don't want to spend lots of hours of time going in a direction that isn't financially feasible. And, and I productive. Totally, totally agree with that. I think sometimes you go out to the community, like in Richard Park, right, and we ask, what do you want, and the list gets very long. So I understand that. But I do also remember hearing from the council that they wanted us to be creative and look at all options and all right. that. So having said that, I think what we want to do is develop a strategy of how do we identify scope and budget mm -hmm. and align those things and um, and to try to manage it in that context. So I think we can do it. I agree. Um, it's hard to make it, you can't decide how many dollars you want to spend until you see what you get for those dollars, but I think we need to look at both scope and budget and have those aligned. And then Chris is And then the debt service on that. Yeah. So maybe the tolerance isn't so much the dollar amount of the project, it's how much the debt service is going to be to pay for that. Right. You know, well, I think you have to. I think you have to approach this from a business standpoint. I mean, this is, it is a business, right? Yes. You're talking about. You talked about two restaurants or five restaurants. You talked about a bridge that connects the whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you pay for it from a standpoint of the business, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the, the issue that we have. Um, and so you, you don't want to limit yourself to say I only have two businesses there when maybe right. three businesses makes it financially. Easy. Uh, possible. You may say, you know, I don't want a bridge, but guess what? The bridge or the under under the street or wherever that is could be financed by a grant or uh, maybe make the other area worth more, make the project uh, dollar-wise make sense. I mean, it's it's a revenue source. It's not just a park. Because if you don't want to spend any money, you know, we've got the sprinkler system in and we can just keep flowing and you got a park because you don't have to spend any money. Right. That's the cheapest way to go. So I think we established that the golfers go, the golf course going to be there. You know, that's no, I understand that. Yeah. But I'm, what I'm saying is that you know, again, trying to sit there and say, well, we need to start to put these parameters around. Somebody's supposed to try and to get an idea of you know what are the possibilities and what out of those what are the possibilities? Where are the funds going to come from? Right. You know, I mean, quite frankly, if you're sitting there saying, well, we can have the golf course, which is what they give priority for us. And we want a couple of restaurants, well then maybe we put some condos up there to pay for all the other stuff. Well guess what? Then you've changed the whole dynamic because you can't come in and say, well it's, we can't afford more than five million dollars. It was going to be ten, but seven or eight million dollars could pay for it. From somebody else's pocket. That's the question. So well, I, I think Chris has given us a pretty good framework to start with with yeah. regards to, he's given us, you know... He's done a wonderful and, job. Yeah. I, I don't disagree yeah. with that. So I think that's a really good well, place the other, to start. Yeah, the other way to look at it is, this is kind of 
um, reverse engineering, but you figure out what your debt service is going to be and how much dollars you can generate right. from that debt service, and then that drives your budget. So. I understand, but in the business, if you, if you go in the wrong business, you, you can't afford any debt. If you go in the right business, you can afford any kinds of debt. Right. So, well, having said that, I'm glad I brought that up because you I can see what a great discussion we're going to have. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be so this, is, this is the hope that up. our audience can come back next in two weeks yeah. and hear this discussion. No, no, I want dibs on that penthouse. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> the on top of that bridge, I, I have one other item. that This came up last week, and Katie and I was about this last week, in regards to an item which we had been on the list, and that's 168, 1C, went by the wayside. Katie and I had a discussion, and Katie had mentioned that she does not recall in the last meeting that anybody wanted to bring that back. So what I did is I went ahead and listened to the tape again, which is always exciting to listen to the tape again. And what did come up is that Katie had asked us twice, did we want to have that there? And twice, Odin had mentioned yes, and I had also mentioned yes. And then even Sean jumped in and says, put my name on it. So I know that was going to be brought up tonight. It was not. So I assume we need to bring that up. Well, so do you guys want to bring back policy 168 is the donation policy it was um, adopted in 2009 from staff's perspective it's worked well we have a form it has handled all donations monetary or um, materials that we've received so i don't have anything to bring forward to discuss about it but if you guys want to discuss the policy let us know and we'll bring it back for a workshop so i'm looking to the council to tell us that they want us to bring it back Okay. Is there a time frame? Okay. I, I agree with the convenience. I don't see that as a, me personally, as a major priority that we need to jump on this thing. Okay. So the reason why I'm asking is because we'll just present the policy and then there'll just be a question and answer. Because we, do you want a presentation or? Oh, okay. Just do it. The last thing I'd like to say is that listen to the recording when I went on. Um, I know we encourage our citizens that if you have any questions or you're not sure what is said or you want to listen to it again, please go online because you can listen to the recording. I was a little disappointed when I went online to discover that the last thing we had there was for January 20th meeting, I think it was. So we, we've had, there was nothing to listen to for the last two meetings. And I understand we had some recording challenges and what have you, but they were able to give me a thumb drive. I was able to listen to it. But the thing that really did become really obvious is I know RJ and always is always pointing out to us, please speak into this thing. Mm -hmm. And boy, is he ever right. Mm -hmm. Because I literally had my ear on the, the speaker, and the only people you could hear clearly is Katie's mic and this mic right here. Mm -hmm. um, can't hear Odin at all. Can't hear yourself. You can barely hear me and the mayor, because we tend to get back away from this and we don't realize. So what I would encourage is all council members, listen to that only one time, and you'll go, I'm going to start speaking into the mic. It is really difficult. And I can see citizens, if they start to listen to that, they'll go, they're not going to come back and listen to it again. Because you, you really can't hear what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion? Adjournment.